everyone and welcome to the very, very first um, Worthing Digital Lunchtime Talks online. Um, it's, uh, it's, we've never done this before online, so um, bear with and um, thank you for joining. It's, it's really good to do this, I think. Uh, today's theme is performance and productivity. And our two speakers are Sam Whitaker of the Human Change Agency and Sarah Archer, founder of the Speaking Club and Story-Led Marketing Podcast. So really looking forward to hearing their mm. talks. Uh, my name is Meg, and uh, I help to organize the Worthing Digital Lunchtime Talks, which are usually held at FreedomWorks co-working space in, uh, in Worthing. I'm the co-director of a company called Shake It Up Creative, uh, which is a design and marketing company based here in Worthing. So I hope uh, everyone is well. I think we might be competing a little bit today with the with the sunshine outside because um, we had a lot of people booked on. Um, and uh, but it's great to see. It's really good to see everyone. Um, I recognize most people. Um, Ruth, it's great to see you on here as well. I haven't seen you for ages. Uh, just a few Zoom instructions before we continue. Please, everyone, take the opportunity to introduce yourselves in the chat box um you know say what you do what your company is you can leave a link uh, either your linkedin profile link or a link to your website wh whatever you like um and also when the speakers are speaking i think mark is going to be muting everyone so there's no none of that kind of background uh noise um please uh also feel free to turn your video on if if you want to because it's really nice to see people's faces um but obviously if you don't want to that's fine as well um it's really good to to meet a few new people that i haven't met before so now i'm going to pass it over to mark for a few minutes because he's going to um say a few words about worthing digital mark ford is the one of the co-directors of worthing digital and i think he's got a couple of news and announcements as well to, to talk about uh, before we get started. Thanks, Meg. Um, so yeah, I'm, um, I'm the sort of founder of Working Digital. I started it, um, I think it's about 12 years ago or something crazy now. Um, normally we were on two events a month um, in the evenings, which are our um, social, which is generally at the, um, well, actually we've just moved recently to the old bike store, which is next door to the uh, cow and oak on the seafront so normally you'll find us in there one evening a month uh, just all having a bit of a catch-up um, and then we normally run a speak uh, a talk uh, one evening as well um, and that's on a wide variety of subjects the last one we managed to do was actually uh, myself and john who helps me run the evening events talking about um, internet of things but we have um, marketing talks. Uh, we've had one on quantum computing recently. So the whole sort of range of digital stuff. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to start those up again soon, but we might try doing a similar sort of thing uh, using Zoom if this works well today. Um, so, I mean, at the moment we're not running any in-person events but hopefully we'll be bringing those back later on in the year and if anybody has any talks that they'd like to give then either speak to me or or Meg afterwards and we can uh, try and make that happen um I don't think I've got an awful lot else to tell you at the moment but um I see that uh, Carol's joined now so I'm, I'm going to hand over to her first of all because uh, Carol works for uh, Community Works which is um, an organization helping to sort of put volunteers in touch with um, with organizations that need people um, and uh, we've been trying to help them find um, volunteers to help people um, volunteers with with digital skills I'll let her explain um, Carol okay hello everyone sorry I'm late had a bit of a techno problem um, yes yeah, so I'm a volunteer and I work at the volunteer center and in normal times we we advertise loads of roles and we meet members of the public and we try and match everybody up uh, these are not normal times. We have hundreds of people volunteering for the sort of practical roles that we're all hearing about, you know, delivering people shopping, staying in touch with older people. In fact, we have more volunteers than we have jobs to give people at the minute. And that's true all over the country, not just in our part of the world. Uh, but what, what is really interesting and the reason I wanted to speak to you guys is we are coming across people 
who are furloughed or are not as busy as they'd normally be with professional skills, specialist skills. And we're going, you've been wasted shopping, tell us about what you can do. And we've been putting them in touch with organisations, charities and small community groups. And they're, they're doing some fantastic work, <laughs> some of the really pressing crisis issues that our established organisations are trying to face at the minute. Um, about having to move all their services online or um, trying to sort out their finances or trying to connect with people who um, are not comfortable with using digital technology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I just wanted to ask you guys whether anyone has, one, would they like to get involved in doing this kind of stuff and has any skills that they think they would be keen to share? Now, what we don't have is a whole bunch of advertised roles, I can tell you, because that's not the way the world is working at the moment. I guess probably for your businesses too, people are up to their eyes just trying to deal with the day to day um, and the immediate. But when I ring them and I say, I've got somebody who's got this skill set and I, I know the organizer well enough to match people up, people are snapping up the opportunity of having people with specialist skills, um, including digital skills that we're offering because they are desperately in need of help. So I just wanted to say, if anyone's really up for doing something and they're not up for shopping and collecting prescriptions, they'd actually like to use the stuff they're really skilled at, then get in touch with me, either directly or via Mark, um, and we'll try and put you in touch with somebody locally that would really, really appreciate your help. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, thank you Carol. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, Carol, what I'll do after this, I'll send out, um, when I send out uh, details after the meeting, I'll put, um, uh, your email out again yeah that. that's great okay Come directly to me yeah uh, so it's kind of working the other way around than it's normally working but if you know what you'd like to do we'll try and find a home for you okay so great I'll, I'll leave you out with your meeting thank you thank you okay thanks carol okay Meg. um okay so uh, also i wanted to say as well like if anyone has uh any initiatives that they're involved with or um, want to give a shout out to that have been created or um, uh, you know have evolved as a result or in response to COVID-19 then at the end uh, if you want to say something about that then uh, please do just let me know in the chat that you want to say something about it or raise your hand or whatever uh, and then what I can do is, is um, you know, save the chat and then put it into the meetup afterwards so that everyone can see. So if you don't get a chance to speak about your initiative or your shout out, then you can put it in the, in the chat box um, and we can save that. Okay, so now I would like to introduce our first speaker for today. Uh, her name is Sam Whitaker and she runs a company called the Human Change Agency. Uh, Sam's professional experience is in organization development, culture change, and strategy development and global commercial leadership. She specializes in marrying an organization's culture with its vision and strategic intent. She supports leadership teams to effectively deliver on their goals while strengthening the capabilities of their teams. I met Sam a few years ago at Brighton Summit and then I attended a really good workshop that she was running as part of the Meaning Conference uh, Fringe and we've kept in touch ever since and I'm really pleased that she's agreed to come on here and speak to us today about how to build a culture for high performance and productivity. So over to you Sam. Right, thank you very much. Can, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, I'm gonna challenge myself and get go and share a set of slides, which I hope I'm managing to do. Yeah. Okay, and I think if there's any questions, Meg, do we want people to kind of put things in the chat box and then you can kind of uh, refer to them later at the end of the talk, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, great, okay. So, uh, it's great to be here. Um, as Meg said, I'm Sam Whitaker. I'm director, co-founder of a boutique consultancy um, called the Human Change Agency. And essentially, I guess our, our purpose is supporting organizations to, to thrive and to transform through, um, you know, making a real positive difference, particularly to the people who work in those organizations. 
So we do things like help organisations go through change programmes. Um, we do sort of team development uh, programmes, do taster sessions on things like how do you build uh, inclusive workplaces? How do you create teams that are innovative and collaborative? So that's the sort of um, work that we do. Um, and all the sort of tools and methods that we use in that work is very much uh, based on the kind of evidence base in the behavioral sciences. So it kind of is reflected in our, in our name, I guess, the, the human piece, which is we very much work kind of with people in terms of kind of what human psychology says about them. Um, so when Meg asked me, and this was way, way back when, when before we had COVID-19 and, and we were all in this lockdown, I was going to kind of talk a little bit about some of that work and how we go into organisations and build culture for, for high performance. Uh, and obviously things have changed quite dramatically since then. And, and just to Carol's point, actually, kind of so many of us now are kind of just focused on the day to day. Um, and I kind of recognise that. But I guess it's also, you know, if, if we're part of, of leading teams, um, there's still very much that, you know, now, if you like, more than ever, that sense of, you know, ways of working, how we're leading those teams, how we're thinking about how we're communicating with them, how we're thinking about that kind of compassion and that empathy, or, or even if you're um, a sort of sole trader or, or part of a sort of micro business, you know, still thinking about how are you sort of supporting and helping yourself through this time? So I still think, I'm hoping that there'll still be things from this that we can take with us, A, for the current times, but also as we sort of look to when, when we're no longer in, in quite the place we're at. So, oh, my slide has not moved. What I might do, because sometimes I have problems with my slides as well, can everybody see it if I do it like that, even though you can see the slides next to it? Yeah. Um, so what I thought I'd take away, uh, give you to take away today was ideas about, you know, how you can boost some of your own kind of productivity. Um, if you do work with uh, other teams or, or, or lead teams and organisations, how you can think about making greater kind of team cohesion and, and collaboration. And also just some practical ways that you can perhaps come more sort of productive and some of the day-to-day -day stuff that you might be doing. Because I know for many of us, these are, these are really kind of frenzied, frenzied times. Um, and the other thing um, I thought in terms of how I'd structure that was, um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about behavioural science. Um, I mentioned that we kind of use tools and methods from that space. So things like psychology, um, things like neuroscience, behavioural economics, all of the insights that have come from those areas is what informs the kind of work that we do with, with people and with organisations and with teams. So I kind of thought I'd do a little bit of a whistle stop through some of that, just to surface, because it might give some insights to you in thinking about how you might do things differently to improve your productivity and um, your performance. Um, but on that, on that talk, I'm also going to talk a little bit about tennis, <laughs> tomatoes and frogs. Um, so we shall see. Okay, so uh, to begin with, I thought I'd ask you all just to take 20 seconds to reflect on what does it mean to you to be productive? And you, I can't actually see chat at the moment, but I'm hoping if you put something into your chat box, it might pop up on my screen. I think we're unmuted now. So yeah, it's I'm like getting everything done that I wanted to get done within the time that I've set to do it. Uh -huh. <laughs> that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, nice. So I'm just having a play, so bear with me because this is yes, yeah, getting lots of stuff done. Yeah, similar to what uh, Sarah said, um, accomplishing what I, I intend to. Yeah, so it's kind of, yeah, so there's a mixture there, isn't there? Some of that's about doing lots of stuff. Some of that's actually getting to that end place that you want to get to. And I kind of wanted to spend a little bit of time just reflecting on that. So when I um, Googled 
dictionary definition for what does it mean to be productive, the first thing it threw up was, and I think I saw now, is that right? Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Can somebody say something? Mark? Yes, yeah, sorry, that was me, sorry. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> amount of something and as I say I think I saw that in some of the uh, chat comments that people made and reflecting on that it is often the case and you know I can certainly relate to that from my kind of experience in the workplace is that when we go into organizations often what we come across is you know a sense that you know people are working really really hard um, there's lots of friends in activity they're doing lots of things they're getting you know they're, they're delivering lots of outputs um, and somehow, you know, and sometimes cultures and organisation can, can therefore suggest, suggest that there's a kind of currency of production um, and that, you know, your value is worth because something because you're producing all this stuff. Um, and actually, as we all know, um, there's lots of things that say that actually, you know, producing lots of stuff and working, working harder and harder can actually be counterproductive, certainly in the mid to, to long term. And that kind of sense of, of producing lots of stuff is often at the detriment of a couple of things, really, I suppose. One is kind of quality of, of thinking. So, you know, we know as kind of knowledge workers um, where, you know, we're being hired. Our talent, if you like, is for our creative you know, thinking, our problem solving skills, our critical thinking skills. All of that needs us to stop and take a break um, from all that kind of frenzied activity. And it also has an impact on the quality of relationships. So we often see this in organisations. You know, we're so focused on getting the stuff done that we don't spend enough time thinking about the relationships we have with other people and how we go about getting that stuff done. I don't, you can see this okay. So just to kind of uh, reinforce that, when, when we talk with people, as I say, they're so focused on this activity and doing stuff and delivering outputs that they actually lose sight of the goal they want to get to. Um, and again, people can feel really good in the short term doing lots of things. But actually, if that means that, you know, in organisations, often it means that people in different areas or different teams are doing lots of different things, they're not all aligned and heading in the same direction, that ultimately, that's not going to deliver the performance that the organization or they as teams or they as individuals are looking for. And actually the better way of um, thinking about that, whenever you get stuck in that kind of treadmill or that hamster wheel, is to kind of step back and say, actually, what is the end goal? What is the outcome that I actually want to get to? You know, so for me, I talked at the beginning, you know, I want to, um, my goal, if you like, is to uh, impact as many organisations as I can to make the workplace a more human experience, I guess. So my objective for doing that, and, you know, I could do that for a year, or I could break that down into quarters or monthly, or what have you. So my objective for doing that could be, I want to have X number of clients, I want to have this much revenue coming through the door, and then the output and the activity that I then focus on will be in service of those goals and in service of those objectives. So, you know, whether that's uh, writing blogs, whether that's doing talks, whether that's looking at, you know, refreshing my website, whatever those things are, they become in service of. And, and, and it's really common, and I don't know if this is from your own individual experience, how quickly we can sometimes lose sight of why are we doing what we're doing and where do we want to head head towards. So when I googled again, um, another dictionary definition that came up and actually uh, I was pleased about, and again I think I saw that in some of the um, chats, was actually we want productivity is actually getting positive results and getting the stuff done that we intend to get done. And so it's sort of um, with that in mind that I want to talk a little bit about how we can get towards that sort of positive, um, productive place. So in the work that we do, we often think it's helpful for people to look at their work through kind of three dimensions. 
So we talk about it as the I, the we, and the it. So very simply, um, the I is about us as individuals. So it's helping people think when they're, when you're in your, in your place of work, or you're undertaking your work, you know, how am I, how am I choosing to show up when I, you know, when we eventually get to the workplace or when we're interacting with our colleagues or other co-workers, you know, how am I responding to, you know, challenging feedback? Um, how am I regulating my emotions when I'm having a really bad day? <laughs> you know, all of those things are really important in terms of thinking about uh, the experience of work and how ultimately how productive and, and how successful you are. The we piece, again, is just about relationships. How do we relate to each other? So, you know, how do I want to work uh, with my co-founder? How do I want to work as part of the team? Uh, if I'm leading teams, you know, what, what do I want them to be like? Do I want them to be more collaborative? Uh, and so on and so forth. And then finally, there's the it part. So that is actually the program of work or the book of work that we're focused on, the actual thing that we want to get done. And, you know, from our experience and what the research tells us is that so many people focus on the it. You know, even in project teams, when you have project kickoff meetings, I'm sure you all experienced that sense of, um, you know, these are the goals you want to deliver on. These are our, you know, KPIs, you know, off we go. Whereas actually how much time when you get together as a team, do you think about, but actually how do we want to work together as a team? Uh, you know, and how am I going to hold myself accountable uh, when things don't go quite right? And, and what are we going to do about it? So in a way, it's all of those things, the I, the we and the it working in harmony, which really starts to make a difference between, you know, yeah, a team that's sort of doing OK to a team that's really high performing. So. I said I'd do a little bit of a whistle stop through um, some of the behavioural science and, and some of the uh, thinkers, if you like, that influence our work and focusing on the I. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, this person called Tim Galway. And for many people, he's considered the kind of godfather of business coaching. And uh, he was, this is sort of back in the, in the 1970s, and he was initially uh, a tennis coach. But um, his insights and his research and his experience showed him that actually the way he coached tennis players to be at the top of their game was also applicable to coaching in other spheres and so he went on to coach you know many business leaders around the world and he came up with this very simple equation which i really like which is performance equals potential minus interference so when you think about your performance when you think about your potential so your potential all those amazing skills and and talents and abilities that we all have within ourselves but potential is also those things that you haven't yet realized. Um, and, and also the learnings and the development that you will undergo as you, as you go through life. So in a sense that, you know, that, that potential is actually huge. Um, but of course, performance is also impacted by interference. So we often think about interference as those external things. So, you know, COVID-19 is a really good example of an external influence that's sort of come in and having a real impact potentially on our, on our performance and productivity at the moment. Um, but something that um, Tim Galway identified, and, and he talked about it as the inner game. So, you know, initially when he was looking at his tennis players, you know, yes, there's two games going on. There's the external, the outer game. So that's the game that we can all see. Um, and that's the tennis player focusing on their opponent uh, and they're going to make it that's going to hinder or help you know their performance but more importantly there's also this inner game so there's this self that we have this running commentary that we have in our heads you know and I'm sure many of you are familiar with that the kind of critiques and comments on the things that we're doing uh, you know I can call it my inner gremlin so it's that Thing that sort of says oh you didn't do that presentation very well you couldn't get the slides working properly or um, you didn't do that negotiation very well or, or whatever it was and we have that constant kind of commentary going on and and what sort of Tim Galway's work kind of surfaced in his coaching was that 
yes, of course you have to focus on the external game. Of course you have to focus on what your opponent is doing, your competition is doing, your customers, what have you. But actually, the more attention you spend on um, suppressing that inner demon uh, and thinking differently about what you're doing, the greater difference it will make to your performance. So actually, there's much more time we can spend kind of being more mindful about, you know, stop stopping criticizing ourselves and thinking differently about, you know, this is a learning or what have you. And that that in and of itself will make a huge difference to, to how we perform. And uh, he talked about it in terms of, he talked about work as a triangle. And again, he said, you know, yes, we all have the performance, which is getting that st stuff done, hitting your goals. That's really, really important. But if you don't also um, focus on the experience of work, you know, how you get that done. Are you incredibly stressed? Are you a bit bored? Are you having fun? If you, and if you don't um, focus your energies and times on learning, so, you know, what did I learn from that thing that didn't quite work as I wanted to last time? Or what new skills um, can I learn to, to grow and develop? That those things are equally as important in terms of delivering on the best performance that you can deliver. And something that I often talk to people about doing, and you can do individually, or you can do with your, with your teams, um, is something that he called Quest. And it's a sort of mnemonic. Um, and essentially it speaks to those things of, of Q. So what are the qualities, what are the attributes that you might want to spend more time addressing? So, you know, if you're a manager, could you actually be better at listening to what people are really saying to you? Um, in terms of uh, understanding and in a sense that goes hand in hand with that could you could you try harder to sort of really think about and understand when some of the kind of hurdles come up if there's a pattern there what does it tell you what can you learn from that and e is for that kind of development of your expertise so yes we all need you know the, the world's moving so fast that we all constantly need to upskill what we know whether it's you know technical skills or leadership skills or what have you s speaks to that strategic so again, going back to that notion of you have end goals, you have outcomes, make sure you, you know, you're not so absorbed in the work that you're doing that you've lost the bigger picture. You've lost that kind of reason or that systemic view of why you're doing what you're doing. And, and time, again, a really precious resource. How could we manage our time better? So I've got some sort of um, practical, more fun things to sort of say, you know, that you might want to introduce into your worlds to help you get a little bit more um, productive, particularly around the, the time issue. Um, and this first one is this idea that you have to eat the frog first. Um, and this, this comes from, uh, it was originally a quote from the writer Mark Twain, and he said something like, if you eat a live frog first thing in the morning, you know, that's the worst thing that will happen to you for the rest of the day. And really, all he's saying, it's very simple, is, um, you know, we've always got those projects or those really crunchy or difficult things that we kind of avoid, that they sit over there nagging us and we really need, know that we need to get to them. But they're too difficult and too challenging. And so we push them to one side. And actually, this really speaks to that kind of, um, you know, something that we all know, which is if you've got a really difficult, challenging thing to do, do it the first thing you do every day. And if you've got more than one of those to do, you know, do the ugliest one first. Um, and what I like about that kind of eat the frog first idea is that it comes, you know, there is a kind of evidence base that underpins that. Uh, so in neuroscience, um, there's a picture of the brain for you all. Um, there's a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. And that's the bit of the brain that, um, although it's kind of in terms of brain development, apparently it's one of the kind of later bits of our brain to develop, that's the bit of the brain that makes all the decisions for us, that problem solves, that does all that critical thinking. So that's really important for solving some of those tricky problems that we're often faced with within our day-to-day -day work. But it also uses a huge amount of energy. Um, and so again, if we kind of, when we sit down at our desks in the morning, do what I'm a bit guilty of doing, which is avoiding that, that frog and actually, you know, going through some emails, answering, you know, you're actually using up really valuable resource. So, you know, there is sort of a science to why if, you, if you've got those really difficult things to, to do them 
eat, eat that frog. Um, a couple of other practical things. Be honest about your calendar. So again, going back to this idea that you've got goals to do as opposed to activities and outputs. So, you know, every day, time management is a real challenge for you. Just write down what are all those goals I've got to deliver on today? You know, one, two, three, four, five. And at the end of that, add in nothing. And then look at your calendar and actually say, okay, so of all the meetings and things that I've put into my calendar, how much of those actually directly um, support me in delivering my goals? And, you know, yes, if, if, if lots of things sit in your nothing box, um, then maybe that tells you something about um, how you're managing your time. And finally, the attention appraisal is, is another good exercise to do. So again, if you've got people you work with, colleagues and so on, you know, ask them honestly to sort of write down for you, what are the things that they think I probably spend too much time on? And what are the things I could probably spend more time focusing my attention on uh, to be more productive. Now, I don't want to show you the slide after this. So, bit, a quick fun exercise. What can you see? I've just put up an array of letters. Does anybody want to tell me what they can see in, in the chat box? Is anybody writing? A part of the alphabet. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, the alphabet from H. Oh, you're nearly there. Somebody's put the alphabet H two O. With commas in between. <laughs> so I shall tell you, and it is a bit of a fun thing. What you can actually see there is water, and the reason being because it's H two O. And it's a bit of a silly um, exercise, but, but I put it in there really just to show you that, again, it speaks to this earlier point about this sort of um, part of our brain which uses up a lot of resource and, and gets tired. Uh, and sometimes when we're stuck on a really difficult project, uh, we've all been there, um, sometimes, you know, the right answers or the, the insights you need are kind of hidden behind the kind of wrong answers in your brain because we're always looking things through the same lens or perspective. So that's just an example to sort of say, you know, if you're stuck, get up, go and do something different. I think I heard earlier one of the um, people on board said they, they often go for a walk and they're, they're changing how they work. So find different ways of working that really help you when you come back to a problem, um, maybe suddenly discover a new insight or think about differently that you hadn't thought of thought of before. Um, another thing we do when we talk, to talk with organisations, and, and I certainly do in, in my individual work, is often people are kind of all aligned, they're all sort of headed towards this goal, this outcome they want to get to, but actually getting there is really challenging. Uh, and it can seem really, really daunting. So, you know, you've got sort of big mountains to climb, you've got sort of, you know, um, uncharted waters to navigate. Um, so what we recommend to people is just chunk it up. So, you know, when we're going into organisations looking at, you know, working differently or, or new ways of working, it's often about pulling project teams together and, you know, yes, you want to get to this place over here, this sort of, you know, goal, longer term goal, but actually what are the baby steps? What are the small goals that you can set yourself or you can set the team, which means that actually it suddenly seems much more manageable and much less daunting than you thought it was. Um, and again, you know, the nice thing about kind of chunking things up into much more small achievable goals is that you, you kind of, when you get there, it starts to build confidence and actually your brain's really, you know, you're releasing all this dopamine. So you're kind of feeling good about it and that reinforces you. And then you start to create a really kind of positive um, momentum. As well as um, breaking work down into sort of small achievable goals. Um, the other things that we also advise to kind of help ensure that you're performing at your best uh, and being most productive is setting yourself or your teams stretch goals. Um, so I'm sure you're all really familiar, familiar with that idea of, you know, sitting in your comfort zone. And we, we you know, often we like sitting there because it's comfortable, we know what it's doing, it makes us feel safe. 
Um, but actually, as well as those kind of fixes of dopamine, we also need a bit of adrenaline um, to kind of take us and move us forward in the right direction. And so it's really important to sort of set yourself slight stretch goals, um, not only because you need that adrenaline, but you also it's also valuable for people from their own developmental point of view. You know, for many of us, there's things we don't like doing, you know, whether that's giving presentations or, or whatever it is. But the more we can kind of push ourselves outside of our comfort zones into our stretch zone, the more we will develop. Um, of course, that doesn't mean tipping into your terror zone because that just freezes everything down and then we're not productive. But you know, if we can start to nudge ourselves outside of our comfort zone, that's really important for our own learning, for our own development, and ultimately for our own performance in terms of, of um, realizing that potential. And actually the danger is if you don't push yourself outside your comfort zone enough, over time that comfort zone will get smaller and, and smaller. So, I uh, just want to talk uh, finally about another area of um, behavioural science, I guess, that really influences our, our thinking and the work that we do, which is, you know, that point really about nudging ourselves outside of our comfort zones. Uh, and often, you know, we, we all know, don't we? We all know what we should do to be more productive, or I know what I should do. Um, and, you know, we can all try willpower and kind of rational thinking. But if that worked, you know, I'd have run several marathons, I would, I'd have written that novel I always wanted to write, you know, I wouldn't drink. <laughs> um, and maybe in the short term that works, but it's really hard for us actually to change our behaviour for the, for the better. Um, so we kind of have to nudge ourselves towards that. Um, and I don't know, again, I can't, it's difficult to interact with you all, but I don't know how many of you come across um, this idea of nudge theory. Um, but I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about that. Um, and that's really, so it's probably helpful to start with the work of somebody called Daniel Kahneman. And he's um, a psychologist and behavioral economic, uh, economist. And he wrote something, uh, a seminal book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And what his, what his research and, and what a lot of evidence shows is that actually in our sort of thinking processes, we actually have two systems at work. You know, rather unimaginatively, they're called system one and system two. Um, and system one, and that's the part of our, you know, that's in our kind of primeval bit of our brain. Uh, that's, that's, that's the bit of the brain that's really fast, that's really automatic, that's really emotional. You know, and again, you sort of back in the day, you know, saber tooth tiger comes around the corner. You know, that's the bit of your brain. That's the bit of the system that you want to work um, because you don't really want think and reflect about it you, you need to act fast um, whereas system two is a bit of our brains or our thinking if you like which is much more controlled much more reflective much more rational and actually what a lot of the um, evidence what a lot of the researchers estimate is that actually nearly 90 percent of our thinking operates in system one so we might think that we're really rational and objective in the decisions that we make and, and in what we do and how we behave. But actually so much of that relies on system one. And that's OK if you want to drive a car, um, go to the shops. But actually, again, when you're dealing with people at work and you're dealing with really complex problems or situations, um, that kind of poses challenges for us. So. The answer in sort of behavioural science is something called nudge theory. Uh, and again, this it was kind of came to the prominence. Uh, there's an economist, in fact, he, he won the Nobel Prize for this work called Richard Thaler, uh, called Nudge. Um, and it's, it's about how do you make it easy for people to make positive changes to their work? So in uh, relation to this, this talk, you know, how do you, how do you help people make positive changes to their behavior so that their performance goes up, so that they become, you know, their well-being improves, they become more productive. Um, and just to give you some example of when sort of nudge theory has been used in the world. Um, so organ donation is a nice example. Um, so when they do surveys, you know, really high percentages of people up to 90% or whatever say, yes, you know, something happened to me, I would want to donate my organs. But then um, the evidence shows us that in places where 
uh, you have to kind of opt in to do that, you know, less than half of people actually carry donor cards. Um, so what a lot of governments have done, and I think actually the UK is doing this if it hasn't already, is rather than you opting in to be a, a, somebody who gives their organs, a donor, the option now becomes that you opt out. Um, another example, quite a fun example in this kind of directional uh, nudge theory is, um, not that I spent much time in, in men's urinals, but um, you know, they can be very messy affairs. Um, so what they did at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam was they put the sticker of a fly in the bowl of the urinal and hey presto, um, things improved because it was much more directional for people um, or for men. Um, and finally, this kind of idea of framing. So again, you can, uh, how you frame things can change very easily how people behave. So again, an example of that, if you're thinking about healthy eating, or going on a diet, um, is that, you know, we all try and do this sort of complicated calorie control thing, but actually, if you just make the plate smaller, um, our brains trick us into thinking that we've got a much bigger plate of food and, and we feel full. Um, so there's just some examples of how they can kind of be used in the world to make those positive differences to how we behave. And as I say, we use them a lot in, in the work that I, we do to sort of nudge teams or people into sort of more positive, productive um, behaviours. And just to finish, um, again, I promised you a, a tomato at the beginning of the talk. Um, and one of the ways you can think about nudging your behaviours a little bit in terms of time management is something called the Pomodoro technique. And again, I don't know, some of you may have come across this. Um, it's a bit like time boxing uh, and those sorts of things, which is, it came about from a, an Italian student, hence the Pomodoro, um, who again would pr procrastinate and not make good use of his time. And he often found that actually he'd sort of, you know, he had several tasks to, to complete and you know, managing his time over those different tasks was, was really poorly done. So he had a tomato timer, hence the Pomodoro technique, and he would set himself uh, a set amount of time in which to complete that task. So rather than being task driven, you know, I've got this essay to write and this project to do, he became sort of time driven. So he, you know, made a conscious decision, this, this project should take me, you know, a morning to get done, that's the time I'm going to allow myself to do it. And so it's just starting to switch how you think about how you approach projects and the work that you do. So, in conclusion, um, and you know, hashtag be kind um, to pick up on the uh, sort of, you know, trending hashtag of the moment, I guess. It's, you know, in terms of being kind to yourself, I think if you really want to do deep work, you know, and particularly tackle those frogs, remove um, distractions, essentially, and, and get to those things first. Take time out, and that's often when new insights will emerge. You know, try and nudge yourself into new habits. I think it's really important when we're sort of trying to get lots of stuff done and manage the day to day that we don't forget to focus on developing ourselves. So, you know, take time out to do that quest or, or something similar. Um, and don't try to bore the ocean. You know, let's chunk it up. Let's give ourselves small achievable goals that we feel we can get done. And then that creates that kind of confidence and good feeling that we all need. And I guess to others, well, it's probably what we're doing all the time, which is, you know, showing up as um, the best person we can be. So that's, that's what I wanted to say. Um, so I shall stop, stop sharing. That was brilliant, Sam. Uh, really, really good talk. I made so many notes. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. That was, yeah, really, really, really good talk. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, I can't see any any questions in the uh, in the chat, but if anyone has a question, um, Mark, can you switch it back to gallery view so that I can see if anyone is raising their hands to to ask a question? Or can I just do that on my own? Oh, I, I think you might just do that. Yeah, I've unmuted everybody anyway. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions um, for for Sam at the moment? I have one actually. I, thank you, Sam. I really, for me, that was very timely. I'm so glad. Oh, <laughs> so, good. You know, it was brilliant. I really enjoyed it. 
Oh, thank that, you. Uh, I worked for 10 years in the NHS, you know, right. Sussex Partnership, the NHS Health um, um, Mental Health Trust, you know, and we know all of this stuff. Like you say, we know. Um, and I'm just thinking of one scenario is I, I sit in an, an office space which is half, half project managers and two hot desk in spaces, which is where I am. Right. So I'm not ever part of a team. I do projects, you know, but not with the projects team. So I work on the bank. So constantly I'm up against people nipping in and out of the project office, um, having uh, discussions, you know, about all of the things, particularly urgent things. And I have to sit there and try and do my own work, mm. it, you know, and, um, you know, quite often these discussions aren't work related, which is all part of it going to work, you know. But if you're not, if you're in a space where you're co-working and you're nothing to do with each other, have you got any tips for somebody like me who sits there, you know, and, and sometimes I feel really excluded as well. I think, should I join in that conversation or should I just pretend that I haven't had... You know, it's all very odd and it's very hierarchy as well. You know, so have you got any tips, Sam? <laughs> Just before I go, because I've got yes, to go. Yes, no, I mean, I think from, so a couple of things there. I think from the exclusion points, what I heard at the end was you sort of saying, you're kind of in that space, but you don't feel like a, a co-worker in the, in the true sense. So I guess that's about, you know, and I said earlier that sometimes these things, we, f we can forget about the importance of relationships. You know, ultimately, it's relationships that, that nurture us, that keep us going. You know, it's not spreadsheets or PowerPoints or <laughs> it's people. Um, so I, I, would, I would reach out to those people and try and create a situation where maybe you stop every Wednesday and have coffee. Um, you know, I think I would just get to know those people because once you start forming relationships, you might then that will make you have more of a sense of belonging in that unit and that might make, i'm sure that'll make you just relax a bit more um but also that might mean that then if they're coming past you every five minutes or talk you know i've been in the situation open plan when people sort of talk over your desk you know it gives you, you know, you might feel able to sort of say hey hey you know actually sorry i'm, I'm doing this really important you know and people if you did it and they didn't really know you they might all take a front and kind of do that awful eye rolling thing whereas actually Oh, that's Janice. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, yeah, you did say you had this really sticky, crunchy problem to, to do today, you know. So I think it, I suppose the bottom line is it's very simple, but we often sort of not do it because we're British. I think it was you said that earlier. Um, get to know them. Get to know who they are. And, and, and those things can will take you a long way. So I don't know if that helps. Yeah, thanks very much, Sam. Thank you. Okay, well, take care. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a, a question um, for you, Sam, as well, from Sarah, who has asked, how might nudge theory be used specifically in a work situation? Okay. Um, yeah, so I think nudge, I mean, I think one of the, um, is that kind of whole idea of, of framing things. So, you know, I talked a lot to organizations about building more inclusive cultures. And you sometimes kind of pe hear people sort of saying, oh, diversity, you know, we've got a real problem with diversity. Oh, we, oh, we need more women in leadership or, you know, whatever that is. But the way they framed that and the language they use means that, that then the problem kind of feels like it's a problem to be solved by the underrepresented groups. <laughs> you know, so there's, there's hundreds of women in leadership programs, you know, we all feel we've got to be better and do things differently. Um, Whereas actually, you know, the reason, the underlying reason why you need a, a greater diversity of perspectives is because we need that for creativity and innovation and all that kind of stuff. So actually, rather than the problem as a problem with diversity, maybe you reframe the language and you say there's a problem with um, homogeneity or something like that, sameness. You know, that, that's the underlying issue. How do we solve it? Or 
you know, that directional point, or, or you could think about nudging from a directional point of view. So again, teams, in order to really get the most from that diversity of perspective, people need to be able to challenge each other. They need to feel comfortable with constructive conflict. And yet lots of us aren't. So sometimes you can kind of be a bit um, directional by saying, okay, so when you meet as a team, each week you're going to take it in turns to be the sense checker or to be the devil's advocate. So you're going to play that role. And the more people kind of artificially play challenging, you know, the discussion around the table, the more that becomes something that people get used to. So you're kind of nudging people to feel much more comfortable. Um, so that's just a couple of examples that spring to mind about how, how you can sort of nudge people in different ways to sort of rethink about what they do, change behavior. Great, thank you. Um, I hope that answered your question, Sarah. That was by um, Sarah Corney, um, not by Sarah Archer, who is actually our next um, speaker. So I think we'll we'll move on. Thank you, thank you again, Sam, for that. Well, thank you. Really, really good. Um, I'm going to introduce our second speaker for today. Um, her name is Sarah Archer. She is the founder of the Speaking Club and Story Led Marketing Podcasts. She helps heart-centered entrepreneurs and business owners use stories and humor to grow their brand and business on stage, off stage, and online as well. She has a background in comedy, theater, and business, and also provides consultancy, coaching, and content creation services. Sarah has two podcasts, The Speaking Club, which is in over 155 countries, and her new podcast, which is story-led marketing. So she's gonna be talking about the importance of story-led marketing in growing your business and how a podcast fits into that. So thank you so much, Sarah, for, for joining us today. Please um, take it away. <laughs> thank you very much. Hi there, right, I'm just gonna uh, share my screen. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Can you all see my slides? And can you hear me? Yes, we can. Smashing, smashing. Uh, good. Right. Well, um, yes, this is what I want to talk to you about, the importance of story-led marketing for business and gro business growth and how a podcast fits in. And what I'm going to do is just switch over to my slides now. So, cool. Okay, so the first thing that I wanted to ask you guys was how many of you would like to get better results in your marketing and grow your audience? You can put it in the chat or you can do a reaction if you can see one or just wave at me, whatever works really. Smashing, smashing good. Right, well, the thing is though, there is a popular belief that may actually be getting in your way. And that belief is that how to content, let's just get my slides, how to content is what you should be producing to grow your audience. And that is wrong and the reason that it's wrong is that if you do have this belief and you're churning out only this type of how-to content then it's likely that you and your message are getting lost in the crowd and and i can understand why you might think that you want to give your audience maximum value and you've been led to believe that how-to content is the best way to do that but it isn't actually true for example, Gary V, you, I'm assuming most people have heard of Gary Vaynerchuk. He's one of the biggest influences around. And whether or not you agree with his message, which is kind of like hustle, 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 um, whether or not you agree with that, he's changing lives all over the world. And he hardly ever does how to content. What Gary V does is he tells stories and he shares opinions that shift perspective. So if you're just doing that how to content, you know, how to do, you know, how to do um, something with something else or whatever, just like that sort of really sort of practical stuff, then it might make someone listen to one podcast or read one blog or watch one video, but it won't make them subscribe. It won't make them follow you and it won't make them buy. Whereas stories will. And that's because stories not only create aha moments but they also create an emotional connection and i think that we're all feeling a deeper affinity 
with Tom Hanks and the castaway story right now, which is a really great example because these stories just help that emotional connection with your message and it also helps people to trust you. And that's why stories are at the heart of my marketing and speaking systems. So if you don't want to get lost in the crowd and you want to connect with your audience and grow your business, you've got to start sharing your stories. And that's what I want to talk a bit more about today. Does that sound good? Assuming, give me a thumbs up. Smash. <laughs> good. Okay, so by the end of the presentation, I want you to know how to get and keep people's attention so that your marketing and speaking has more impact. I actually believe speaking is a massive part of marketing. That's why I actually call it sparketing, the whole sort of things together. Uh, and the second goal is that you're inspired and excited to start using more stories in your speaking and marketing. Hopefully that sounds good. But before that, I just thought I'd tell you a bit more about me. So pretty much for, for much of the last 20 years, I've had people laughing at me and I've uh, created stories that have made grown men cry. But that's enough about my career in HR. Um, and basically, I have uh, th th those things are both true about my career in HR, but that's not what I mean. So I, I have uh, been doing stand-up comedy and theatre, also writing plays uh, and, and, and mixing it all up with business for, for quite a while now. And alongside uh, and, and and i now have a couple of podcasts which um may mentioned uh, the biggest one which has been going longest is thank you very much for that but i'm tish i like that james thank you um and one of them's been uh, going for a few years now it's in uh, 156 countries now and the other one is, is fairly new but i i love doing them but the irony of all this is that as part of my training and experience as a comic and as a writer and, and as an actor I've been practicing all the things that I'm going to share with you today, including how to get an audience's attention and keep it. Because if I hadn't, I wouldn't have, you know, I've probably got gonged off and certainly wouldn't have got offered other gigs. So in all of the in scenarios that I speak or perform in, I want to affect the audience and I want to sell them an idea. And that was, if I was working in HR, I wanted to sell change. If I'm, if I'm performing, I want to make people laugh and so on. But what was happening was that in the business and marketing context, I was going about it in completely the wrong way. I was creating my message in a way that I thought demonstrated my authority and the compelling features of my product or service. But actually, what I was doing was overwhelming people with information. And a great example of this, I used to do some network marketing, you know, that sort of MLM marketing, whatever you call it. And I thought the company and the service were absolutely fantastic because I'm, I'm still a customer today. And so what happened was I would go and see potential customers and I'd get so excited about the product. I told them all about it, whatever. It was like I vomited all over them. <laughs> and this is what they looked like. And one day I had a team leader come with me and he said, Sarah, you sold it, then you bought it back again. And like after, after that, I was absolutely determined to learn all about marketing, sales and influencing. But you know what? Frustratingly, I found time and again that the secret to successful influencing and selling was telling engaging stories. So eventually, I also, though, realized that there was another really important piece of the puzzle that I'd missed. And that was how to get people's attention in the first place so that they'd be ready to listen to the story. And I now incorporate what I discovered into the way that I create and deliver all my content. And that's the first thing that I wanna share with you today so that you can connect more powerfully with your audience too. So this is what I'm gonna cover and Sam has set me up absolutely perfectly for this. So thank you very much, Sam. So attention, this is what I'm going to cover, the attention trap that many people fall into, the secret formula for engaging an audience and how to apply that formula to your content, your biggest asset, and how podcasting fits into my content marketing strategy. So let's go with the first one, the attention trap. The thing is this, right? Attention is the most precious commodity around. 
And there's so many more distractions these days. Attention has never been harder to get. And now that we're online and we're doing presentations online, it's even harder to keep people focused on what you're saying. And on top of that, there are probably some assumptions that you might be making that lead to one of the biggest mistakes I see people make when communicating, whether that's in marketing, speaking, or pitching. But before I tell you about that, we need to take a quick look at the human brain again. Now, our brains uh, developed in three phases. First came our old brain, sometimes called the monkey brain, the lizard brain, or for our purposes today, we're gonna to call it the croc brain. It's the point of entry for all information. And it produces those strong basic emotions that drive that fight, flight, fight or flight response for the saber tooth tiger that Sam mentioned. But what it doesn't do very well is reasoning. And then there's the middle bit of our brain, that's the limbic system. And this takes care of the meaning of things and deciphers social situations, <clears throat> excuse me. And then we have that other part of our brain, the one that Sam was talking about, the neocortex. It's the newest part of the brain. That's where we do our problem solving and our complex reasoning, as Sam said. But as I said, every bit of information we receive is going through the croc brain first. And when it receives this information, it's evaluating it based on the following criteria. Is it gonna kill me? Is it new or is it complicated? And depending on the answers, it runs the following programs. If it's not dangerous, ignore it. If it's not new and exciting, ignore it. If it's a new thing, summarize it as quickly as possible and leave out the details. Basically, don't send anything up to the neocortex unless the situation is unexpected and out of the ordinary. Now, on top of all of that, our croc brain, as Sam also pointed out, is focused on our survival. And part of that is that conservation of energy. So if what you're saying isn't easy to understand, then it will also ignore it because of the energy it needs to process it. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we use the term pay attention because if attention costs us energy, we only have a finite, finite amount. So that means if you want someone to pay attention to you, then you have to earn it. So here's the attention trap. And I used to fall into it myself. So basically what happens is when I, when I used to sit down to write a business pitch or presentation, I used my clever neocortex to pull it together because I assumed the target of my message would be listening to it at the logical reasoning level too. But boy, was I wrong. Because if, and if your pitch or if, if a presentation is full of facts and information, the concept you're trying to get across are complex or abstract, you might, be, you might as well be shouting into the wind. So um, you've got to, uh, basically it also doesn't just apply to pitches and presentations, it applies to all of your content. Because if your website isn't easy to navigate, the croc brain will decide it takes too much energy and go somewhere else. You've all heard probably seven seconds. Actually, it's about three seconds you've got. Um, if your Facebook lives don't grab attention, you won't get people hanging around. So this is powerful stuff. So you've got to bear that in mind when you're pulling information together, especially for your marketing. So what do you need to do? Well, that's what I want to talk to you about next. How do you keep, get that attention and keep it? But first of all, I need to tell you what attention is actually made of. And again, Sam mentioned the, at least one of these things earlier. So attention happens when someone is feeling both desire and tension. And there are two chemicals that drive these feelings. Dopamine is the chemical of desire and another chemical called norepinephrine just, oh, every time I say that, it just makes me want to go into my darling Clementine. So that's actually how I remember that. So just I'll take that from me. That's my little extra gift to you. I won't sing it. I'll spare you that. Um, so thank you. Uh, Noraprine frying causes us to feel tension 
And both of those things together make human beings act fast and pay attention. Just like this, dopamine, anticipation of reward, plus no repine frying, fear of loss equals attention. And I, do you ever Dr. Doolittle? This, this is, is kind of what you need to be doing with your content. You pull you, you push you, you pull you. And that will become a bit clearer later on. So let's talk about dopamine first. Dopamine triggers when we anticipate a reward and we get a big hit when something is a novelty or surprise. It doesn't have to be a big thing either. It can be a, a, vid oops, it can be a video about a new piece of gadget. It can, uh, an idea provides novelty. Good metaphors are absolutely, they make, they make complex ideas relatable. They provide novelty. And also unusual images and moving images provide novelty. That's why we'll pay attention to video and animations much more than just talking heads. So, you know, bear that again in mind for your marketing. And Facebook has been designed to give us dopamine hits each time we get a notification. They've been clever little sausages over at Facebook and, uh, and that's why we're always on it. But talking of Facebook, recently I went to London with one of my clients and she's also a friend and she also is a medical tattooist. Her name's Vicky Martin. And we went to London to protest because Facebook kept shutting down accounts of people who posted photos in groups of areola tattoos on women who've had mastectomy after breast cancer. So my friend Vicky, my friend and client, organized for a massive inflatable boob to be put outside Facebook HQ. And she took along 50 women with her who were singing. Now the people in the offices across the street were at their windows looking, taking videos, uh, traffic stopped, and that video and the story of the massive boob outside Facebook was the number two most viewed on the BBC and has since gone viral. Why? Because seeing a massive inflatable breast out on the street outside Facebook was a novelty and a big surprise. But, uh, that was a good day out that was, um, but um, dopamine on its own is not enough to keep attention. You do also need that no reprine frying and tension to keep people engaged. So let's have a chat about that. So no reprine frying is triggered when there's something to be gained or lost, when there are high stakes. And that is why a story without conflict is boring as anything. If we watched a film uh, and everything went brilliantly for the hero, it would be so boring. Tension and the different obstacles that the hero needs to overcome and their reaction to those challenges is what keep us, keeps us hooked. So um, you need both surprise and tension to keep attention. And that is why I believe, so you basically got fear, desire, and curiosity that are three of the big marketing hooks. The reason why I believe curiosity is probably the most powerful trigger for getting and keeping attention is because it combines both the anticipation of reward and FOMO, tension, uh, and that, that basically is those, those two things working powerfully together. And now that you're aware of this formula, you'll probably notice curiosity is used all the time in so many different, in different mediums. Um, so we, we, basically, we love opening the mail when the envelope isn't brown. <clears throat> we also, they use it massively in TV shows and books and, and uh, movies where they have the cliffhangers, you know, right before the advert and then right at the end of the book, keeping you hanging on for the next thing. And also, if something is secret, we're desperate to find out what it is. No, no, uh, no surprise that they call the law of attraction book the secret. Um, and then Amazon's deal of the day. And here are also a couple of examples from uh, marketing. So this is a couple of the top one. They laughed when I sat down at the piano, but when I started to play, that is a really old direct response 
a piece of marketing there, but it's got a story in it. And you're like, why? Why did they stop laughing? You know, why did they stop laughing? And then the California Pizza Kitchen used curiosity, curiosity brilliantly. They basically gave their customers this, uh, this thing which was sealed, but they couldn't open it until they came back. And if they came back with it open, there was like a prize inside. When they came back with it, if it was open, they didn't get the prize. So massive use of curiosity in marketing there. And uh, yeah, so the question is now, how can, is it, well, first of all, has there been any light bulb moments there? Or you're probably all, you know, veterans and you've heard all this stuff, but hopefully it's generated some, it will certainly make you a little bit more cynical, I guess, especially with the press <laughs> at the moment. Um, so that's basically the formula for getting and keeping attention. But the next question is, how do you apply it in your talks and content? Well, for getting attention, keeping attention, influencing and getting sales, I've already told you the answer. The most powerful tool is story, and especially the ones with humor in them. Basically, if you can find a way to communicate your message with a story, you'll have so much more success with the croc brain. And there are four big reasons why, okay? The first reason is that you stories make great hooks. And before you can get people uh, to open up, to be ready to listen to the full thing, you need to hook them in. And I wanted to give you some examples of where a story is a little hook. So the first one, imagine this, you saw this, his business was failing, then he discovered storytelling, and now he's living at large. There's a whole little story in there. And I picked these up from The Guardian today. I thought I'd go highbrow. This isn't your usual um, uh, tabloid clickbait. Lockdown leaves festival goers stranded on beach with sewage problem. Hmm, there's a story in there. Um, and then they had a picture of I, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but I Y Y or A Weiwei, the, ch the guy from China. And he had, I became the enemy of established power without a crime. Again, quite compelling, a lot of curiosity in there. And then another one, let them eat cake. New Zealand couple document luxury life in COVID-19 quarantine. I did think that the COVID-19 was a bit superfluous there, but they've made it rhyme, so good for them. The second reason why stories are so powerful is because if you can use people or everyday things in your story, complex or abstract concepts become more concrete, simple and relatable. Number three, because stories create that emotion and novelty, we don't know what's gonna happen, so we pay attention and we've been conditioned to do that ever since we were painting in caves and you know, back when we were little children, our parents read our stories and we've just been it's the way that we've evolved and we're conditioned to pay to lean in when we hear a story four good stories have tension and conflict and as part back to that no repine frying it's it's what keeps us engaged and invested so if i haven't already won you over to using stories by now add to this list is that they do influence people to make a change better than anything else. So your biggest asset are your stories. And when I say your stories, I mean your stories. People often have this idea that they haven't got any interesting stories to share, but you absolutely have. And one thing I will say, you know, you've only got to look at the rise of reality TV to know that people are interested in your stories. You know, they, they definitely are. So a place that I use stories loads is in my podcasts and I wanted to, uh, Meg asked me to talk to you, I'm not a, I don't teach people how to do podcasting, um, but I would share what, what I've got from it and, and you know, how I started and so on. So I started my first podcast in October 2017, that was the Speaking Club. I wanted to get my message out there, I have a strong view of what makes a good speaker and it doesn't always align with the sort of, um, Toastmaster view and I wanted to get an alternative view out there and I chose podcasting for a number of reasons Firstly because it's my favorite platform of choice 
And I would advise you if you are thinking about, <clears throat> excuse me, putting out some regular content, you know, if you're thinking about whether it's blogging, YouTube, or, um, you know, podcasting, try and choose the one that you like the most. Um, but I, you know, I certainly listen to podcasts all the time. The other reason is the simplicity of it. I can do my podcast in my pajamas. Um, it's not as, uh, there's not so much of a requirement of video to be, you know, that sort of production value and so on. Also the intimacy. I can speak to people right in, you know, back to the sort of brain stuff. It's right in the year. And, and finally, um, the ease of use. You know, people can listen to podcasts when they're running, when they're cooking. It's not required to watch something as well. So for all of those reasons, I chose podcasting. It's becoming incredibly popular. However, it is still a massive market space. There's a very small percentage of people that have podcasts and even smaller amounts of people that continue to do them. So uh, that it works for me. If you're thinking about doing a podcast, here's some tips about launching. Um, get some branding. You, first thing you need to do is obviously get, uh, I don't often talk about branding first, but you do need a little thumbnail for your podcast. So you need to think about branding and messaging. Um, you need to get your podcasting platform set up. I use a, a platform, a hosting platform called Libsyn. There are also other ones called Buzzsprout, uh, not Buzzsprout, Sprout, I think. There's a few out there and a really low um, and sort of easy way to get started is one called Anchor. So that's another one. So and you also need to get set up with Apple podcast as well. Um, when I started my podcast, I made sure I had five episodes in the can, three to release on launch day and two for breathing space. And I, I made sure that I had a long run up. So, well, five weeks, I think it was. So I had a landing page, a sort of it's coming soon page. And back then we had something called Thunderclap, which was amazing, but it's gone now. So, but it's about, but you know, basically this is back to sort of, you know, back to creating that curiosity, just like they do when a new film is coming out, they have trailers to tease and they have people going around and talking. So, you just got to build that curiosity ready for when you launch. Um, next thing is my content strategy for the podcast. The first thing is that the content that I put out in the podcast is linked to my marketing strategy and plan. So if I've got a product that I know I'm going to be launching or a, you know, a workshop that I want to run, then I, I will probably add in some content to the podcast that will either deal with people's objections or get them interested in what I'm going to be um, doing, uh, sort of launching or whatever. Content mix. Um, I have, I try to mix it up a bit. I alternate between solo shows and interviews. Interestingly, love my solo shows get the most downloads for some, for, I don't know. Anyway, it's, you know, they get good downloads across the board, but solo shows always seem to be more popular. Um, I have guest selection criteria. I get often um, uh, people asking to come on the podcast, but I'm always, I, you know, I do curate who comes on so that I get the best uh, for my audience. So I will do stuff that is non-speaking related, but they're likely that they are a speaker and that I always ask them to share about speaking. So it's always got to be relating back to my core message. Um, a tip here, if you are wanting to go on other people's podcasts, don't target people who have the same thing, skill as you say, you know, trying to sell the same stuff. I get quite a lot of speaking coaches try and come on my podcast. And if there's an angle, I will, I will do that. But that's just, that's like me going to next and setting up a gap uh, rail in the shop, you know, so you, you've got to try and tackle it a different way. So that would be my advice. advice. And I always give my guests advance notice of the questions so that I can get the best out of them for my audience. Um, marketing strategy is mostly organic to date. So it's kind of like building up uh, word of mouth and getting reviews and so on. I am just starting to advertise. So I'll be using Facebook ads to promote the podcast. And also um, there's a strategy called Dream 100. Basically you put 100 people that you want to connect with and, and sort of collaborate with so I'll be reaching out to other people to go on their podcast as well. 
not my competition, but a sort of it would be complementary to what they're they're sharing. So um, the other thing is quality and consistency wins. So you know, do make sure that you, if you say you're going to do a weekly podcast, do a weekly podcast. If it's going to be monthly, that's fine. It doesn't have to be weekly, but you know, just stick to the schedule. And lastly, um, in terms of the ROI, um, yes, it's great. It's in 156 countries now. Biggest uh, listeners are America, followed by, I think, UK, then Australia, Canada, and so on. Um, I'm just turning my, my notifications to come back on. There we go. Um, it's had about 76,000 downloads, which isn't massive. Uh, I'm not a massive influencer, um, but it's not bad either. That's quite a few. Um, I've had quality leads from the podcast. You know, it's, it's generated quite a bit of business for me. But I think the most important thing about what's happened as a result is that the feedback about how it's helped people. There's nothing, I mean, it's really rewarding to hear um, how people have, you know, developed their skills and got results in their own businesses and their own lives as a result. So that's the biggest thing for me. So that's my sort of quick trot through. Um, do you have any questions? I, I know, I don't know if you want me to take them now or at the end, um, probably with, do you, Meg, do you want me to take them now or? She's typing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mark, for unmuting me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, if you want to have, if anyone has any questions, um, put it in the chat box, uh, and then maybe ask when, when you're done, how, how much are you, are you, have you got more to, to uh, cover Sarah? No, I literally, it's the questions. And then I was just going to say, if people wanted to get, have a, a storytelling toolkit to help you get uh, oh, your cool. stories out and a free pitching book to help you with your pitch. That was it. That's all okay. I have to say. So oh. thank you very much for listening. Great. Yay. So, thank you. I've unmuted so everybody, by the way. Oh, great. Um, should we go back on to the view? I'll stop share. Ah, great. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I love stories and I think storytelling is so much, um, you know, a part of, of what we do as a business and that's what gets me engaged in other people's uh, business or content or ads or whatever it is they're doing so yeah i definitely agree with that does anyone have any any questions for sarah i didn't see anything come into the oh wait yes i uh oh no that's um no i don't see any questions in the chat box but if anyone has any questions please ask now you can unmute yourself as well if you have any questions. Can I just ask a question about the last part, Sarah? You about the the kind of the breakdown and the and the tips of getting started with podcasting. What was the you know how long did it take from uh, the the start of your planning? Because you said you had three podcasts ready and then two extras to go to to create that kind of padding space, breathing space. How long did it take you to create that initial content once you decided to, to do the podcast? Um, it's not too bad. I mean, there's, so if you have guests on, so I think the first two, the first three episodes, one was a solo show. And then I did think I had two guest interviews with the next ones. So um, the more um, traction that your podcast gets, the bigger the guests you'll be able to get on, if that makes sense. So I started off my podcast with um, people that I'd met in networking that were related to speaking. So I think one was a magician uh, who does weddings. I was interested in him, his sort of stories. And the other one was a murder mystery lady. So in terms of recording the podcasts, um, I always allow an hour. So it's a Zoom call and to record the Zoom call. And then, you, you know, if it's an interview, just top and tail, I think, in all it depends how you do it these days i try and batch content i try and batch interviews and that's always better um but it can some solo shows take me a long time to write probably too long i have to pick up some of sam's productivity tips so it's as long and, and it's as you do it so some people will just record everything right there and then if they've got the guest i record my intro intro separately so it really and it depends how long the podcast is so my shows solo show will be about 20 minutes 15 to 20 minutes 
and an, and a guest interview will be between uh, half an hour to an hour, normally around sort of 45 minutes ish, I think. So it can be done quickly, but it just depends really on what length it is. And so it does vary. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, any other questions for, for Sarah? I think these, this is going to be uh, recorded as well. If anyone wanted to um, go back again, we always put them on. Mark always gets them up on YouTube. Um, Jay, oh, James is here. Um, he's the one who always uh, does that when we do it in, in real life. He, he does the recording and then gets them up on YouTube. But um, we are recording this and they will be on YouTube as well afterwards. Um, and again, I'll put... Um, the introductions and things like that in the meetup too. Um, but before before we we kind of close, uh, I just wanted to give a, an opportunity that we had at the beginning, but some people may not have been in on the beginning to share any init initiatives that you've been working on yourselves or in collaboration with other people. Um, that have been in response to COVID-19. Uh, we had Carol on at the very beginning who gave a shout out for something that, that they're doing that they're looking for. And Mark will put that up on um, the newsletter and the meetup as well. Uh, but if anyone has any shout outs that they want to, to give uh, now, uh, please do that. Or you can put it in the chat, whichever, you know, however you want to do it. Um, Sarah, I think you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, um, I saw another question come through. I just do you want me to pick that up quickly before oh, I mention yeah, my right, shout yeah, out. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So James, I think it's it's um I, I know of some people who have got results from putting their podcast onto YouTube. Um there are a number of um you can use something called Clipscribe or Wave, I think. They do put some sort of pitch up, but I I'm not sure audio like I'm not sure it works as well. You know, YouTube I think is a visual medium. So people will be expecting to see that, but I, I don't do it myself. So I can't really speak to the results. So, I, you know, I think what I would probably do is do a, a, a video version of a podcast. If I had a, a podcast that was really well downloaded, I'd probably create a video version of that. So, but you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't know. So I haven't, don't do it myself, but I know it does work, but I'm not sure how well. Um, just, uh, just wanted to say, yes, um, I am a, a comic as well, and one of the things that happened as a result of lockdown was that loads of comedians lost their income overnight. So myself and my uh, business partner, Emma, we put together a, a, a platform called couchcomedylive.com, and we are using Zoom webinar, and we're running live gigs. So with comedians, sort of three or four comedians, and the audience can interact and laugh and you know, answer questions, and it's only three quid. And that's at uh, couchcomedylive.com. So check it out if, you, if you're bored and you want to, if you, you've run out of Netflix, basically. I'll mute myself. Can, Sarah, can you put that link into the chat as well if you haven't, if you haven't done that yet? Thanks very much. Does anyone else have any, any um, shout outs um, before, we, before we finish? Not on um, not on the COVID side of things, but um, I've just put up the link to uh, our Web and Digital YouTube channel in uh, in the in the uh, chat as well. Uh, there's lots of content to go back on uh, from the past ten years or so in there, so uh, plenty of stuff to look at. There was a talk about a year ago from uh, Simon Collinson uh, talking about the importance of gut feel, and that touched on some of the same sort of uh, topics around the. Uh, um, primitive brain and stuff like that so if, you, if that stuff you're interested in that might be one to go back and watch um but there's as i say loads of stuff in that in that channel okay fantastic good thank Can you I some very very quickly Meg. yeah you, sure just on that um also just on support um just because I'm, I'm a trustee for relate which is like um, a relationship counseling um what, what was the old marriage guidance counselling, but now they do all sorts of counselling for young people, for any kind of relationships. Um, and they're now uh, offering, you know, if people are suffering from the isolation, from sort of mental health issues or struggling through the sort of, you know, lockdown, 
um, they are now offering counselling services for sort of, they can't offer it completely for free, but for sort of £30 for a session. Um, and I don't have the details with me, but I shall send them to Mark and that can go in the newsletter as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I I think, I mean, you know, it, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know when lockdown is going to end, but um, the next Worthing Digital Lunchtime Talks should be in um, about maybe beginning July. We will be able to meet in person. Um, if not, then perhaps we'll do it again in this way. Uh, Mark, what about any other, any other Worthing Digital stuff that's coming up? We've got nothing in the calendar at the moment. John and I have been talking about things, but um, it'll be good. I think we might try and just do um, like a social meetup one evening. Uh, probably on Zoom, and then we'll try and get some more talks in the calendar. But we were we were running out of uh, we got to the end of the Rolodex, I think, um, for for evening talks. So um, if anybody knows anyone that has some talks that they might want to give, then um, now would be a good time to let us know about it. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you, and huge thanks to uh, Sam and Sarah for your talk today. Really enjoyed them immensely. Very 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 good um thank you so much and it's great to see everybody on the on the meetup to on the meetup today on zoom uh, i think it i think it went okay i hope so um thanks mark very much for um for doing this uh because i, I you know i love these talks so much and it, you know i'm just glad that we're able to to continue them even if it has to be um on this way so thanks everyone for joining um thanks a lot mark and uh, take care, uh, stay well, yeah. everybody, and, and hopefully see a lot of you soon again. Thank Bye. you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank take you. care. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.